Okay. Uh, yeah, so as Mike mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the physics department at Columbia. Uh, I work in cosmology. Um, and tonight I'm going to tell you about uh, some of the ongoing work um, that we're doing related to the cosmic microwave background um, in my research group, and then also with uh, collaborators at a number of uh, different institutions. In particular, I'm going to focus on some of our recent work um, with this instrument, which is called the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Uh, this is an experiment that's predominantly funded by the National Science Foundation, located in the Atacama Desert of northern Chile. All right, so let's get started. Good. So most of what I'm going to talk about tonight is motivated by something called the Hubble tension, um, which is actually related to one of the most fundamental questions in cosmology, Namely, how fast is our universe currently expanding? This is something we've been trying to measure for about 100 years now. Um, and this has received coverage in uh, a number of different media outlets, including the New York Times, as you can see here. What was this guy? Good. Um, Quantum Magazine. Um, and we even got our own XKCD cartoon. So for those who are into XKCD, you'll know how exciting that is. <laughs> All right. So before we get into the Hubble tension, let me introduce some of the basics of physical cosmology that have let us learn about uh, the fundamental properties of our universe over the last hundred years. We're not gonna have time to go through all of the details tonight, but I at least wanna give you a flavor into uh, some of the physics that lets us um, learn these, these things. So first of all, um, we've known for quite a while now that the speed of light is finite. So that means when we look out at very distant objects, we're actually looking back in time. We see those objects as they were when the light was emitted, not as they are now. So when we look at some distant galaxy, we might be seeing it hundreds of millions of years ago or even billions of years ago. Um, we've also known for about 100 years that the universe is expanding as time moves forward. And that has a number of dramatic consequences. So I'm going to first the first part of this talk just describes some of those consequences um, and what they imply. So for example, the more distant an object is from us, the more that its light will have been stretched by the cosmic expansion as it travels through the universe. So as a light wave travels through the universe, you can think of the wavelength of the light getting stretched as the universe expands. And I'll show you some cartoons to help you visualize that in just a minute. Uh, this implies the existence of something called the cosmological redshift, which we represent with this variable Z. So this just expresses the fact that the wavelength of the light that we measure in our telescope, lambda observed, is a factor of one plus Z larger than the emitted wavelength of that light. So in our laboratory, Z equals zero. This ratio is just equal to one. But for some very distant galaxy, as I'll show you in a moment, you know, this can be some number that's significantly larger than one. So the light waves are getting stretched out. And for those um, who might remember, you know, some of the basics of mechanics, this looks like a Doppler effect due to the recession velocity that an object might have. But this actually isn't a physical velocity. It's much more accurate to think of it as the light waves getting stretched by the cosmic mm -hmm. expansion rather than the galaxy somehow moving. All right, so here's um, what this looks like actually in a real spectrum of a galaxy. So this is a plot that shows the brightness of light as a function of the wavelength of the light. And you see these spikes, which come from emission lines in the atmospheres of stars and the galaxy. So for some nearby galaxy at redshift zero, this would be what the spectrum looks like. That same galaxy, if you place it 1.5 billion light years away, which is a redshift of 0 0.1, you can see that these spectral lines indeed get shifted to longer wavelengths by a factor of 1.1, as promised. Okay, so this is the first important fundamental fact about the expansion of the universe. So how should, ah, oh good, and I think I've already said both of those things. So how should you think about this in an intuitive sense? Um, the way that I like to think about this is to imagine reducing the number of spatial dimensions from three down to two. So assume that instead of living in three, three dimensions, we live in two dimensions. And for example, you can imagine that we live on the surface of a balloon. So not within the, the sphere itself, but just on the surface. In that case, you could think of the cosmic expansion as being represented by the surface area of that balloon increasing with time. Okay, so that's what's being represented here. The galaxies, for example, our Milky Way galaxy would be represented by these yellow dots. The galaxies themselves are gravitationally bound. 
So our Milky Way is not being pulled apart by the expansion of the universe, just like the Earth isn't being pulled apart by the expansion of the universe. Uh, there's this famous scene in Annie Hall when the doctor has to reassure Abby that he's not, that Brooklyn is not expanding. And indeed, the physics is correct. Brooklyn is not expanding. Uh, so if you ever get confused, just keep that in mind. Um, but on large scales, the distance between galaxies is increasing. And that's represented by this uh, type of, of cartoon. Okay, so the galaxies are spreading apart, but they themselves are staying the same size, so they're gravitationally bound. Um, and then the photons, light, light waves, their the wavelengths are getting stretched. So they go from bluer to redder colors as the universe expands. Okay, so then we want to discuss how we would quantify the rate of expansion, which is called the Hubble constant, although it's not actually a constant, it's just the current value of the expansion rate. So that's called H naught. Um, it's not a speed or a velocity, but it's actually a rate. So it has units of one over time, just like any other rate. And we use these funny units in cosmology where H naught is represented in units of kilometers per second per megaparsec. And I'll explain those units in a minute where they came from. Um, but note that both kilometers and megaparsecs are units of length. So those cancel out. A megaparsec is about three times 10 to the 19 kilometers. Things are really far apart in the universe. Um, and so then you're just left with units of one over time. Okay, so that means then that if we took the inverse one over H naught, then that's a time scale. And there's a very important time scale in cosmology, the most important one. And that's the rough doubling time of the universe at its current rate of expansion. And given the current value of H naught, which is somewhere around 70 in these units, that tells you that it takes the universe about 10 billion years to double in size at its current rate of expansion. Okay, so these are some of the important ballpark numbers to, to keep in your head. So in one slide, here's a diagram of the history of the universe. Um, so time in this diagram flows from left to right. The early universe is over here on the left. And then we just have one dimension of space, really, which you can think of as the vertical direction, or it's really this two-dimensional circular direction. Um, the universe is spherically symmetric on large scales, so uh, we can represent its size just with one number, which is the so-called scale factor of the universe. We normalize this to have a value of one today. Um, and then the expansion rate is just given by the derivative, the time derivative, uh, dA dt divided by a, so the fractional rate of change of the size of the universe. And this Hubble constant I mentioned is just the value of this h of t at the present time today. All right, so most of the talk today, we're going to focus on sort of two different epochs in the history of the universe. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about the late time universe, when there's galaxies and stars and people that we know and love. And then I'm going to tell you about the cosmic microwave background, which is a relic of the very early period of our universe's history. All right. Okay, so the main cosmological number that we're going to focus on in this talk, indeed, is the expansion rate of the universe, H naught. We know lots of other things about the universe, too, and you can ask me about that later, but I'm just going to focus on this for tonight. So you might wonder, how do we actually measure the expansion rate of the universe? There's two main methods, and I'm going to explain both of them um, and then tell you about some potentially exciting discrepancies that uh, we're seeing between these measurements. So the first method involves the so-called classical distance ladder. This goes back to the early days of modern astronomy, and this is the same technique that Edwin Hubble himself was using. And this method lets us infer H naught in a so-called direct fashion. The second method involves fitting data from the cosmic microwave background or large scale galaxy surveys. Um, and we then have to fit some detailed cosmological model to those data. And then we back out H naught as some derived consequence of that model. So in that sense, it's an indirect inference. So keep these two methods in mind. We're not, now gonna go through the details of both of them. Okay, good. So let's start with the distance ladder. So this goes back actually over a hundred years now um back to the early 1910s and 20s so you may have heard of Edmund Hubble but you probably haven't heard of this guy um he actually predated Hubble and made some of the important measurements that Hubble did or used so Vesto Slipher he was an astronomer at the Lowell Observatory in Massachusetts and he made the first measurements of the cosmological redshift of galaxies so he looked at a diagram with these spectral lines like I showed you a minute ago and observed that they were shifted from their wavelengths that they would have in the laboratory on Earth. Um, and you can go back and read 
this great paper, this is the first one, the radial velocity of the Andromeda Nebula. Back then, galaxies were called nebulae. Um, and it has this great sentence, extension of this work to other objects promises results of fundamental importance, <laughs> which you know, sometimes people just really have their yeah, eye on the prize. And he was completely right. So five years later, he had collected enough data that he noticed that um, these galaxy red shifts indeed were predominantly red. So they could have been blue shifts. The galaxies could have looked like they were flowing towards us if the universe was contracting, but instead they're mostly red, um, which tells you that the galaxies appear to be receding away from us. As I mentioned earlier, there's not actually a physical recession velocity. What you're actually seeing is that the light waves are getting stretched out by the, expect, uh, by the effect of, of cosmic expansion. Um, but that's why you'll see these words, recession velocity appear sometimes, especially in the early days of cosmology. All right, so it took another decade really to figure out what was going on. Um, by the late 1920s, Edwin Hubble uh, and his assistant Humison, they had put a bunch of data together, including Slifer's data, and discovered that there's this relationship between this apparent recession velocity that I mentioned, the stretching of the light waves, and then the distance to the galaxy. And um, one funny thing is even in very famous papers, people make silly mistakes. So the units of this axis are not units of velocity, they're in units of distance. So even Hubble himself made mistakes. Um, but the slope of this line indeed expresses the current expansion rate of the universe, h naught. So one can show, starting from very basic first principles, that uh, the current cosmic expansion rate uh, <laughs> is given by the slope of the apparent recession velocity uh, divided by the, the distance. All right, um, good. And this also then explains the funny units that I wanted to mention. So again, this is an apparent recession velocity, but we could express it in units of kilometers per second, which is what Hubble should have done. This should say kilometers per second. And then on the x-axis, this has units of millions of parsecs or megaparsecs, so that the units of this guy are kilometers per second per megaparsec. And that's the origin of those units that we still use today. So it goes back to Hubble himself. Okay, so this is all well and good, but uh, you may be wondering, how did we actually know what the distance to any of these objects is? It's not very easy to tell how far away something is. So how do we know the distance to anything out in the universe? Um, there's two main techniques that we rely on to do this. So the first is a so-called standard candle. So this is represented you know, in this cartoon by literally imagine you have some candle whose intrinsic brightness you know. So suppose you constructed the candle yourself, you know exactly how bright it is. If I then put it a really, really far distance away from me, I can see how bright it appears. And then using basic, uh, you know, basic physics, you can back out how far away it must be. Okay, so that's the idea of a standard candle. Of course, we have to be lucky that nature gives us any astronomical objects that actually are standard candles. So we, we are quite lucky in that sense. And then the second uh, method is a so-called standard ruler, which is a similar idea where you imagine I literally had a ruler, a yardstick. I know exactly how long it is, it's one yard. Then if you put it really, really far away, you see how big it appears. And then using basic trigonometry, you can draw a triangle and figure out how far away it must be just from the angular size that it subtends in your field of view. Okay, and again, we have to be quite lucky that nature gives us some standard rulers out in the universe as well. All right, so let's talk about how this actually works. So one important type of standard candle um, is a so-called Cepheid variable star. And Henrietta Swan Levitt, who was an astronomer at Harvard in the early 1900s, um, was the first to discover the fact that there's an empirical relation between the pulsation frequency of these Cepheid variable stars um, and their true brightness. So these stars tend to have um, light curves that look like this. This is the brightness of the star as a function of time. You can see that it oscillates in this regular pattern. It's related to some very beautiful physics in the atmospheres of these stars. Um, but it's easy to measure the frequency of this curve. And it turns out that that's very tightly related to the true brightness of the star. So if you can measure these things, you can then back out how far away they are because they're a standard candle. All right, so that's the first type. Um, and then the other important type that's proved essential in the last 20 to 30 years are type 1a supernovae. So these are exploding white dwarf stars that have a very well-known um, peak brightness in their light curve. Um, and indeed, these types of supernovae, one of which you see here in this 
nice image from Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, these were used to discover the acceleration and the expansion of the universe in like 1990s. Um, and today we're still using them as, as well. All right, so in one slide, this is a, a summary of what the current classical distance ladder looks like. This is very similar to the plot that I showed you from Hubble himself 100 years ago, but now with lots of data points with small error bars. Um, so on the y-axis is now the distance in some funny astronomer units. Don't worry about those. On the x-axis is the redshift, i.e. this recession velocity is double thought of it. Um, and the slope of this line gives us the current expansion rate. So the best measurements that we have um, come from a team led by Adam Rees, uh, who shared that Nobel Prize in 2011 that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, and the numbers that they are finding are h naught around 73 kilometers per second per megapascal, with a pretty small error bar, plus or minus one, which is pretty remar remarkable. It is worth mentioning that there are other teams that find somewhat different numbers. Um, there's no statistically significant discrepancy between them, but it's worth keeping in mind that the picture is still a little bit muddy and we do need better data. But the thing to keep in mind conceptually is that there's this value that's a little bit higher than 70 that we find from this classical distance ladder technique. Okay. All right. So that's method one. Now let's talk about method two. So how do we measure the expansion rate of the universe from the cosmic microwave background? First, I should tell you what the cosmic microwave background actually is. So this um, takes us back to some fundamental facts about the expansion of the universe. So because the universe is expanding, the average density of the stuff in the universe is decreasing with time. And then through basic thermodynamics, um, you know, just high school chemistry, you probably remember the ideal gas law, um, that then tells you that the uh, contents of the universe are, are cooling down on average. Okay, so right now things are pretty cold out in interstellar space, but if you hit rewind on the movie and go back to earlier times, it means that it was one, once much hotter and much denser. And in fact, you go to sufficiently early times and the, all the matter in the universe was actually in the form of a hot ionized plasma. So in this diagram, early times are on the right, well, diagram, really, or cartoon, uh, early times are on the right, late times are on the left. So today the universe is filled with you know, neutral hydrogen atoms that we know and love, but in very, very early times, the temperature of the universe was so hot that all these electrons were ionized and floating around away from the protons. Um, and during this period, the universe was completely opaque to light. So you can imagine the universe was basically in this hot, dense fog. If we had been around, you wouldn't have been able to see you know, very far in front of you. It's literally like being in a fog but the temperature of the fog is thousands of degrees instead of you know, a nice, nice 60 degrees like we had today. Um, okay, so what that means though is that there was a crucial moment when the universe transitioned from this hot ionized plasma to this state that we know and love where the light can just travel freely. And the moment when that happened was a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. Okay, and that's what's called the epoch of recombination. Um, in terms of the cosmological redshift, it took place at a redshift of around 1100, so much, much earlier than the, the redshifts of the galaxies that we were talking about earlier. Um, this, this moniker recombination is sort of silly because this was actually the first combination. So we're referring to the combination of the electrons combining with the protons to turn into neutral hydrogen atoms. Um, that was the first time it happened, but it's called recombination for some silly reason. Okay, so what are we seeing in these images that I've showed you? So this is a map of the sky that's been unfolded, um, some particular projection, so I can show it on a 2D screen. And what you're seeing are very small differences in the density and temperature of the universe at that time, just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. So let's zoom in and take a look at one of these maps. This is state-of-the-art data from the Planck satellite, which was a ESA NASA joint mission that flew uh, during the 2010s and just wrapped up a few years ago. So what we're looking at here are small differences in the temperature of this radiation across the sky. And in order to make these differences visible, I've increased the contrast on the map by a factor of 10,000. So the average temperature of this radiation is around 2.7 degrees Kelvin. So it's very cold. And it was first discovered in the 1960s. There's a great funny story I can tell you afterwards about how it was discovered. Um, but importantly, we've now discovered that there's in fact tiny differences in the temperature of this radiation 
um, which are giving us a snapshot of what the universe looked like just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. So the universe was a very different place back then. There were no galaxies around yet. They hadn't gravitationally collapsed to form. Instead, all that was around were just clouds of ionized hydrogen and helium and lots of dark matter, of course. Um, and later, under the influence of gravity, those would collapse to form galaxies. Um, one fun fact, as I promised in the title of the talk, is that indeed this is the oldest light that we can observe in the universe for the reason that I mentioned earlier. Prior to this time, the, the whole universe was suffused with this hot, dense plasma, which was totally opaque to light. So with electromagnetic observations, we can never hope to see any time before this, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, which is pretty close to the beginning, so we're lucky. Okay, so how do we actually use this map to infer the current cosmic expansion rate? You might think it's complicated, but it's actually a pretty simple argument. So it turns out that there's a standard ruler imprinted in this map. So we talked about standard candles with the first method. Now we're gonna use a standard ruler. And I'll zoom in in a second to show you the ruler. Um, this standard ruler has a known physical size that we know how to compute. It's imprinted in this map. And what it corresponds to is the distance that a sound wave could propagate in that plasma if it set off at the beginning at time equals zero, the Big Bang, and then traveled until the time of recombination. So sound waves propagate in this plasma, just like they're propagating in this room through the air. Of course, the physics is a bit different because it's a plasma and not this gas, but we know how to calculate what's going on. So let's zoom in a little bit so I can show you this. This ruler is called the sound horizon. Um, it's just the distance that the sound wave could propagate. Um, so let's zoom in on a tiny slice of the data. So this is a small patch of a CMB map, um, which is made from a combination of data from our experiment in Chile called ACT, and then the satellite data from Planck. These are hot and cold spots, um, as you can imagine from the, the picture. So to guide your eye, I put down a bunch of tiny rulers that correspond to the actual angular size of this ruler in the map. So there's a hot spot here, there's, this, you know, there's the ruler, there's a cold spot of about the same size. And if you just sort of do a magic eye thing, you can see that indeed there's lots of these spots that have exactly that size in the map. Um, we're pretty lucky that nature gave us this standard ruler. There's lots of other beautiful physics imprinted in this map too, which I don't have time to tell you about, but it's, it's neat that you really can pick out this feature really just by eye. Okay, so what does that mean? So we measure the angular size of the ruler on the sky, right? This is a two-dimensional map of spheres. So we measure the angular size of the ruler, uh, but we know how to calculate what its physical size is. So through basic trigonometry, we then can infer the distance for the CMB. So then we have a distance and we have a redshift. I told you what the redshift was earlier. So it's kind of like having one of these distance versus redshift diagrams with one single data point, but it's a very, very precisely measured data point. So here's the values of, of H0, the current expansion rate that we infer through this procedure. Um, the top result up here comes from the Planck data, and then the second result here comes from a combination of data from ACT, uh, our experiment, and then a predecessor satellite, the Planck, which is called WMAP. So these are two completely independent measurements, completely separate data sets. You see that we get very consistent results of around 67.5 or 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec with very small error bars. So thinking back to what we discussed earlier, there's some interesting difference between this number, which is a bit below 70, and the number that we got from this classical distance ladder technique, which is a little bit higher than 70. If the error bars were bigger, then everybody would say, well, we just need to measure things better. There's nothing to worry about. But the error bars have gone pretty small. And now people are worried that perhaps there's something more interesting going on. So the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to tell you what hints of something more interesting this could be pointing towards. All right, so the first clue is related to the fact that this second method is a model dependent method for inferring H0. So the way that this comes into play is that the predicted size of this ruler that's imprinted in the CMB map, it depends on the cosmic history prior to recombination. It depends on the constituents of the early universe. So how much dark matter was there? How much radiation was there? How much regular atomic matter was there? Etc. And of course, through the details of these maps, we have very strong constraints on, on those constituents, but that's why it's, it's, uh, it's model dependent. Um, and of course, one also has to model how the universe evolves after uh, Redshift 1100. Okay, so the idea then is the following. We're going to posit 
that the measurement made with the classical distance slider is correct. The true value of H naught really is something like 73, but that we've gotten a biased answer with our analysis of the CMB because we used the wrong model. So the idea is that we want to introduce some kind of new physics beyond the standard model that will explain why this value of H naught should have come out to be 73. All right. So we're going to set off with our llama and try to figure out where we went wrong in the CMB. And this is a, a very hot topic with many people thinking about such theoretical models. It's been quite a challenge to try to solve it. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of ideas here in the second chunk of the talk. Okay, so the first thing one might assert is that this is just a systematic error in the data. People have spent many, you know, person years figuring out if there is a systematic error, and so far nothing has been identified, but it's worth keeping, keeping that in mind. Okay, so the first possibility, if it's not systematic errors, is that uh, there's some new physics that altered the physical size of this ruler in the cosmic microwave background. So the way that this would work is the following. So let's imagine that we introduce some kind of new physics, which decreases the physical size of the standard ruler, okay? So it's physically a smaller object, okay? Now we've measured its angular size on the sky. That's what you, you saw it in the map. I literally showed it to you. Um, so that means that to keep that angular size fixed, we would have to decrease the distance to the CMB itself. And as the aficionados may know, the distance is all scale like one over H naught in cosmology. So that means that if you decrease the distance to the CMB, you're going to increase the value of H naught. So you might be able to go from 67 up to 73. All right. So this is a very simple type of idea, very compelling. And there's a number of ways that you could actually implement this with new physics. And I'll talk about them, at least one of them in a minute. So you could introduce some additional radiation in the early universe. We know it can't be standard model photons, regular light, because that's very highly constrained. So that's be some kind of a dark radiation that we don't know about in laboratories. Um, you could introduce some kind of early dark energy. Um, there's a few possibilities. So that's one option. Another option is that there's some new physics that actually alters the dynamics of the epoch of recombination. So this is the process by which this ionized plasma combines to form these neutral hydrogen atoms. And for decades now, people have modeled this going back to the 1960s. Um, but it's possible that there could have been some other type of physics at play. So for example, people have explored the introduction of primordial magnetic fields, or even allowing the fundamental constants of nature to vary. So things like the strength of the electromagnetic interaction, um, the gravitational constant, et cetera. This is pretty extreme, right? We're talking about pretty extreme modifications of the laws of physics here, but uh, it's been quite a challenge to come up with models that can solve this problem. Um, for this, for this uh, type of scenario, the generic uh, way it works is that you accelerate the process of recombination somehow, and that makes it then happen a bit earlier. It happens at a somewhat higher redshift, and that then through various somewhat more complicated arguments results in a higher value of H naught. So these are kind of the two main routes that people have explored. I would say at the moment, we don't have a model that seems fully compelling from, from all aspects, but uh, this is so far the best that we've been able to do. All right, so let me then tell you about some of the actual results that we found searching for these types of new physics in data from, from ACT. All right, and for those who want to read the papers, they're all available, <laughs> or you can talk to me afterwards. Okay, so what is... ACT. Uh, this is the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. As I mentioned, it's down in Chile. As you can see, we chose a great site to measure the CMB. Um, the sky doesn't actually look like that in Chile. It'd be nice if it did. Um, we've covered about half of the sky uh, with our survey um, using this instrument. And it was actually just decommissioned. We observed for about 15 years um, with, with some gaps to upgrade our detectors. Um, but we just decommissioned the telescope actually a few months ago. Here's the actual telescope. So the thing you see here in this image is actually the ground screen that we built around the telescope to shield it from uh, extraneous radiation, from these mountains and so on. So there's the actual telescope. This dish right here is about six meters in size. So this is quite a large object. Uh, then there's a smaller one meter secondary mirror and then the receivers are down here. We have a collaboration of about hundred people. We finally had an in-person meeting a few months ago in Princeton. Um, uh, comprises maybe 20 institutions or thereabouts. Uh, so by the scale of particle physics experiments, we're quite small. By the scale of cosmology experiments, we're mid-sized. 
All right, so here's some actual, uh, let me give you an actual taste of the data from ACT. So I mentioned the Planck satellite earlier. This is a small slice of a CMB map from using data from Planck. Um, and then what I'm going to show you in a moment is how this looks after we combine ACT data in here with Planck. So you might notice this image looks a little bit fuzzy. Now here's what it looks like after we put in the data from ACT as well. So I'll flip back and forth between these two so you can get a sense of the improvement. So it should look to you like there's this blurry image from Planck and then put in ACT and it sharpens up into this very nice clear picture. Um, so in addition to the, the CMB hot and cold spots, which you can see, there's also other cool things in this map, these little red dots, which are uh, supermassive black holes accreting uh, matter. And then there's also some blue spots, which are galaxy clusters casting shadows in the CMB. But uh, we don't have time to talk about those today. But I just think the data is spectacularly beautiful. So this was um, the latest data that we released back in 2020. We have much better data that I'll highlight uh, at the end of the talk, which is still under analysis right now. OK, so using this data from 2020, we set out to look for potential evidence of some of these new physics scenarios that could resolve this Hubble constant problem. So the idea is that we introduce some new physics into the early universe that would yield a higher value of H0, and we should be able to see evidence for it in the statistical properties of these CMB maps. So we looked for basically all the different things that I highlighted a moment ago. So first, we looked for additional dark radiation beyond the neutrinos that we know and love in the standard model. Um, we do not see evidence of this in our data. We looked for primordial magnetic fields that could have accelerated the process of recombination. We didn't see evidence of those. We did see, I would say, mild to moderate evidence for two interesting uh, types of new physics. So first, uh, this so-called early dark energy. So this is some kind of new energy density form that would have popped into existence just before recombination, slightly accelerated the expansion of the universe, and then it would have gone away. Turns out that one can actually write down models that do this that are not totally insane. But uh, surprisingly, we did see two, two or three signal preference for something that looked like this in our data. We then did a separate analysis where we introduced the possibility of strong interactions between the neutrino species in the standard model of particle physics. That's not something that's in the standard model. The neutrinos really don't interact with anything. Um, and we saw an interesting two to three sigma preference there as well. So it's early days. None of this hits the five sigma threshold we need for discovery in physics. But there were some interesting hints. Um, I'll talk for just a couple of minutes in a little bit more detail about this early dark energy model. Um, this got some attention in, in nature and, and other outlets. So let me show you one graph to summarize how this model would revise our understanding of the history of the universe. So what this is a graph of is as a function of redshift, so earlier times in the history of the universe are on the right, later times are on the left, this is the fraction of the total cosmic energy budget that's in the form of this new early dark energy substance. So in the standard model of cosmology, this stuff doesn't exist and this curve is just zero everywhere, okay? But we fit this novel model to the data from ACT in 2020, as well as combined with some other data sets, which are the results shown in other colors here. Um, and what we found was that somewhere on the order of 10 to 20% of the universe, just before the moment of recombination, which is the vertical line labeled right here. So just to the right of that line, 10 to 20% of the universe may have been in the form of this early dark energy substance. So this would be a pretty significant revision of our understanding of the history of the universe. Um, Important, if true, as my PhD advisor used to say. Um, so it's early days, um, but this is potentially the first hint that we're seeing that something very dramatic happened in the early universe that we're, we're just learning about right now. So this is exciting. Why are there some reasons to have caution? So one is that if you do a separate analysis using the ACT data or using the Planck data, you get somewhat different results for this early dark energy scenario. And importantly, Planck doesn't really prefer the existence of this really dark energy. So there's something interesting happening with the data. Everything here is kind of at the two-ish sigma level. So it's hard for us to say exactly whether there is truly a systematic effect that could be plaguing the measurements of one or the other. Um, but we have much better data coming up very soon, as I'll tell you in a minute. Then from the theoretical side, um, which I've spent quite a bit of time working on in recent years, it's been hard to construct uh, non-crazy versions of this early dark energy model. Um, 
we can write down particle physics scenarios that, that achieve the effects that we want, but none of them look particularly nice. Um, and then there's another important issue which I've swept under the rug, which is that if we mess with anything in our model of the universe, you have to make sure that it doesn't break measurements that we've already made. So we've measured, for example, the distribution of galaxies in the modern day universe at immense precision, which is something I hope to talk to you about afterwards. Um, and if you change the energy density constituents of the universe, put in this new exotic stuff, you have to be very careful that you don't break the agreement that we currently have between the cosmological model and these galaxy survey measurements. And it turns out that this EDE model does introduce some problems in that regard. So although this could be a hint that this some kind of uh, new ingredient like the surly dark energy, what does that play in the real universe and does it yield a higher value of H naught? I'd say it's still early days and it may be the case that we're sort of just, you know, feeling out the outline of the elephant without actually seeing what the whole core of the elephant looks like. But that's how science works. All right, so in the last couple of minutes, let me tell you why you should have reason to be excited, why this isn't the end of the story by any means. So all the analysis that I told you about so far was data that was collected through the year 2016 with ACT, and we've continued surveying all the way through 2022. So our next um, analysis is called Data Release 6, and we are actively hard at work on that right now. I have telecons tomorrow morning about it. Um, and we expect to release the results from that analysis, I would say, by the middle of 2023, perhaps fall of 2023, so later this year. Um, our group at Columbia is co-leading the main analysis of cosmological model. Um, so stay tuned whether this hint of early dark energy or other new physics is actually real. What's exciting is that our data, as you can imagine, going from you know the data collected through 2016 to 2022, it's a huge, huge increase in the amount of data. So our constraining power is significantly better than, than we had with the, the 2020 data set. Um, the Planck satellite is unfortunately done, but it's still a fantastic tool that we're making use of. So we have the, the Planck satellite data, we have this ACT telescope data, we have colleagues at the South Pole who are working on similar types of analyses with their data. And then we're building a, an even larger experiment in Chile, which is actively under construction right now, I'll show you some pictures in just a minute, which is called the Simons Observatory, SO. So this will start in early 2024, survey for about five years, and it's even more sensitive than ACT by a significant margin, about a factor of, of three. And then later on in the 2030s, there's a super experiment called CMBS4, which is even more powerful than Simon's Observatory, um, which would encompass both Chile and the South Pole sites working together. So here's the Simon's Observatory. This is a collaboration of a few hundred people. So we're starting to look like the particle physicists now, uh, but that's okay. We have, to, we have to build big things to answer big questions. Uh, predominantly funded by the Simons Foundation. Here's Jim Simons, um, as well as many other contributors. Um, the scale of the experiment is around $100 million right now. Um, we're building it at the exact same site as ACT. So here's a rendering of the site. So this is our ACT telescope here, which has just recently been decommissioned. Um, and there's two other neighbor experiments that are taking data right now. And then the Simons Observatory project is being built over here. All right, this is a fantastic site to measure the CMB um, as we've discovered over the past 20 years. So here are some images of the real hardware. This is uh, the cryostat that holds the detectors for the large aperture telescope, which is this monstrous thing over here. There's a person for comparison right there. So the size of the dish is about six meters, but has a very different architecture than the APT telescope. Um, and we're packing in tens of thousands of supercooled transition edge sensor detectors into these uh, instruments. So here's some real pictures from the site. This is down in the Atacama Desert. Um, these are some of the sister small telescopes that we're building to go along with that big one for a different type of cosmological science that I can tell you about afterwards. Um, this is you know, by far the most sensitive CMB experiment of the 2020s. And what's exciting is that at Columbia, we're playing a, a leading role in many of the uh, most important aspects um, of the analysis of this data. So stay tuned. Um, let me wrap up here. And um, as I mentioned, we have the, I would say, hints that there could be something missing in our current understanding of cosmology as represented by this tension between these two methods for measuring the expansion rate of the universe. And what's exciting is that the different types of new physics that I've told you about 
generically predict that there should be interesting new signals in the CMB. And we have really, really fantastic data coming in the pipeline shortly that should let us find out whether there is indeed some new physics there. So stay tuned. Thank you.